turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 with me. We'll be looking at this chapter for the next few weeks. It's a bit of a longer chapter and working to break it up a little bit. As we get into it, I think you'll realize very quickly it has quite a sound to another book in our Bibles, the book of Proverbs. A number of these verses are Proverbs, and so it has a very similar feel and sound to chapters you might read if you read in the book of Proverbs. And so for that reason, we'll be working on smaller sections through this chapter. Um, it, it, it all works together, certainly all kind of connects, but it is smaller sections that seem to work best in connections. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 6 this morning, and we'll read those in just a moment. But I want to review very quickly and connect something as we get into our text this morning. Last time we were looking at this book, we were in chapter 6, finishing up chapter 6, and there's a question that chapter 6 concludes with. It's the question back in verse 12, for who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life which he passes like a shadow. Who does know what is good for man? And in that message, if you remember, I directed our thoughts to Micah 6 and verse 8, which says, He has told you, O man, what is good. This is the Lord telling us what is good. And if you know those three things, he says, The things that are good are these, to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's a good summary, a good encapsulation. But our text this morning picks up on the idea of what is good and offers an answer. Certainly those three things in Micah 6, 8 are the ultimate answer we could say. Uh, We might bundle it all together and say this, that what is good is to love God. We could encapsulate it with that. But this passage gives us some direction in specific things about what is good. And so if you look at Ecclesiastes 7.1, you'll see the word better is used there. And just kind of make some connection here. That's the same word translated good back in 6 verse 12. So what is good? Well, let me tell you some things that are good, or the translation is better. It's the same word, same Hebrew word. And uh, it shows up, that word shows up 14 times in this chapter alone. Uh, Seven of those are translated better in the ESV. That's the highest concentration of this word in the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you think of it this way, think of it, last time we were in this book, we looked at chapter 6, and remember I said that chapter is one of the darker, darker chapters in Scripture. Really, really wrestles with that, and my soul wrestled with it. But we saw some really good hope at the end as well. Well, turn the page and you come to a chapter that now, 14 times the most of any chapter in Ecclesiastes, extols and lifts up, here's what's good, here's what's better. So we're going to look at that this morning. What is good for man? And let's read the first six verses of the chapter and then we'll look more closely at them. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Just going to jump right in. Solomon in verse 1 offers something good for us to consider in this first verse. The phrase literally reads, better a name than good ointment. Better a name than good ointment. Solomon defines good here by comparison, which is interesting. Because I think if we thought long enough about it, we would realize that typically we define good more by contrast. We tend to go, well, lying is bad, so honesty is good, right? We define good more by contrast. There's nothing wrong with that. But what Solomon does in this passage, in this verse in particular, is he defines good by comparison, 
And we're going to see this all throughout this text. What he does is he puts on the table something that we would widely perceive, or at least his readers would have widely perceived, as a good thing. And then he brings something else in, and typically it's something that's counterintuitive, and he goes, but this is better. This is good. So the first one here, better a name than good ointment. Solomon is presenting something as recognized as good, precious ointment. And again, just make some connections. That word precious is also the same word translated good in 6 verse 12 and the word better in 7 verse 1. So we have this word good just popping up all over the place, right? So here's good ointment. And I'm going to show you something that's, I'm going to use bad grammar here, that's even more gooder, okay? (laughs) Kind of get that little stress there. So good, good, good. We have the same word running through, and now we have precious ointment. In Solomon's day, this precious ointment would have been a valuable commodity. Just give some thought here for a second. Uh, this shows up in, in 2 Kings chapter 20. We're told that Hezekiah opens his treasure houses to an envoy from Babylon. Isaiah records this as well. He opens up his treasure houses, kind of shows off all of his wealth. Hey, look at all the wealth I have. And that list of his treasures includes things like this. Silver, gold, spices, his armory. Those are all things that we would go, yeah, I can, I can see that being part of a king's treasure. And then this one, same phrase, precious ointment. This is a valuable thing in that day. In Solomon's day, this would have been a king's treasure. In Psalm 133, David uses this same thing, precious ointment, to speak of the anointing of a head, and he refers to even the head of one called Aaron, the high priest. So this is an anointing oil, an oil that you would use for a very important ceremony occasion for designating this is the servant of God. And a little bit of other study I did this week, um, came across some things, this kind of oil would possibly be used as well for softening the skin. It'd be the kind of thing you'd rub into your skin and try and kind of soften things under the Arabian sun, um, very hot, dry temperatures, uh, kind of like a lotion, all right? Think of this as a very premium lotion. You're going to spend a lot of money for this one, all right? But it works really well. So a precious commodity, a very valuable commodity. And so everyone reading this in Solomon's day, as he puts this item on the table, would have nodded in agreement, yes, that is a good thing. Which makes it all the more interesting when Solomon puts something else on the table, we read a name, or we add in, translations add in, a good name. Sometimes this word translated name refer to one's moniker or like your name. My name is Kyle, right? Well, in Genesis chapter 2, we have this kind of example when we're told that the name of the first river in Eden is the Pishon. It's its moniker. It's its title. That's how it's known by, right? That's one way this word can be used. But the other way it can be used is to refer to one's reputation or character. And we have this as an example of this kind of use in Genesis 11, where we have the people of the earth, they're on the plain of Shinar. Remember this, they're building a tower to the heavens. And why are they building a tower? What's their reasoning? We're going to make a name for ourselves. What, they're looking for a title? No, they're looking for a reputation that lasts long after they're gone. We want to be known. So a reputation or character. And here in verse 1, that would be the sense that seems to be Solomon's mind here. He's talking about a good name, one's character or reputation. Now, let me just say this. Some have drawn a distinction between those two words, character and reputation. The idea being reputation is what everyone sees and knows you by. Character is what you really are. And I understand that distinction probably is a good distinction in some cases, but this morning, what I want to do is actually, I believe good name would encapsulate both. I believe good name would encapsulate both an inner character that's reflected correctly, accurately in outer reputation. And I think that because this is, the, this is the way God speaks of his name. God never talks about himself in the terms of, well, you see a reputation, but the character is different. 
So I think if we're looking at this and understanding what Solomon's saying, he's saying, look, here's the better thing, here's, here's the, the best thing, a good name. Well, that would be this. That would be a character that's reflected accurately in reputation. So I'm going to refer to all of it, reputation, character, good name. It's going to all be the same thing this morning, right? So just kind of putting that out there. Don't want to confuse anyone, all right? Not making that distinction. Solomon compares a good name with a good ointment. It's nice to have moisturized skin. All right, it's wonderful to have, a high, to have a kingly treasure like precious ointment or oil in your possession. It's a privilege to be anointed with such a fine oil. But if you have to choose between outward beauty or wealth or privilege and a good name, you want the name. It is a good thing. It's the better thing. And this really is no new truth. Solomon actually has already said this in another proverb, back in Proverbs 22, verse 1. He says, a good name is to be chosen over great wealth. So he says the same thing back there. Um, Throughout history, men and women have echoed that kind of wisdom. For example, a Syrian slave in the Roman Empire named Publilius Cyrus purportedly wrote, a good reputation is more valuable than money. Or, Queen Elizabeth I of England is said to have claimed, I would rather go to any extreme than suffer anything that is unworthy of my reputation. Or, the American businessman John D. Rockefeller is quoted as saying, the most important thing for a young man to establish is his reputation. These are some pretty major voices in history. Just not even Christian history. And they're acknowledging the same thing that Solomon's getting at here. We don't really have a problem with Solomon's identification of what's good here. Choose the good name over the good nard. All right? But the second phrase in this verse really begins to trouble us. The ESV reads this way, And the day of death, then the day of birth. Folks, I've got to admit, going into this week, hadn't really thought a lot about that. I knew this passage And I'd often thought in general in terms of, well, you know, I've learned a lot more at funerals than I have at parties. And we'll talk about that in a moment, okay? It's just just the honest truth. But, But here's the reality. I hadn't really thought about what he's saying here. He says a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death, I'm going to add some words, is better than the day of birth. I want you to think about that for a moment. This verse is Hebrew poetry, which means it's, it's pithy or short principle. And Hebrew poetry, like this, helps our memorization and it forces our meditation. All right? It doesn't come with all the nuance to it. It doesn't come with a dictionary of explanation. Here's what's going on. It doesn't come with footnotes. Here's the proverb. And you sit there and I sit there and we go, wait, what? And it should make us think. We have to suck on it like we would a cough drop, slowly extracting the flavor and benefit that is there to be had. And we can supplement some words like I did and say the day of death is better than the day of birth. It sharpens the struggle. Solomon again takes us to something we agree is good, the day of birth. But this time his better item, I would argue, is not agreeable to us. The day you die is better than the day you were born? The day you leave this life is better than the day you entered it? Are you really comfortable with me saying that to you? The day you die is better than the day you were born. I would think that would come off a little bit as a bit of an insult. I would hope. Folks, my point is this. We don't agree, actually. The more we think about it, the more inside we we begin to argue and go, I don't really know. I agree with that. We throw annual parties to celebrate births. We do it at one year old, 10 years old, 50 years old, 75 years old. But no one that I know of bakes a cake, wraps up presents, blows up balloons, and sings happy death day to you on every anniversary of a loved one's death. Uh, That even sounds wrong. 
We might remember a deceased loved one, even celebrate their life, but we don't celebrate their death. No one sits around and says, you know what the definition of a good day is? The day so-and-so died. We don't agree with this initially. So it really pushes us, what is going on here? Solomon, what are you saying? Well, remember, this is Hebrew poetry. Specifically, it's a parallelism. Hebrew poetry has a variety of these, and Brother Kutcher has mentioned a couple of these in Sunday school class, recent lessons. It's been helpful. Hopefully caught a few of those as we've been being able to be here for those lessons. Uh, one of those examples is synonymous parallelism, where the second phrase repeats the idea of the first, but it does so in different words. Usually helping to understand, it kind of sets each other off, Right? This verse here is what we would call synthetic parallelism, where the second phrase adds something to the first. All right? So if I can just say it simply this way, think of it this way. Two phrases and the second builds on the first. They're connected. Which is really important because that means this. We can't just take that second phrase and say this is a general, all-encompassing truth of all of life. The day of death is better than the day of birth. That's not the point. It's not the point for me to go out and be like, you know what, the day you die is better than the day you were born. That's not the idea. I've got to keep it connected to the first phrase. It's doing something with that first phrase. So here's what that looks like. I'm going to walk us through this. We agree a good name is better than precious ointment. So folks, just think about that. We will spend most of our lives trying to grow and guard a good name. All right, but you and I know how quickly a good name can be lost. I believe it was Benjamin Franklin who said, it takes many good deeds to build a good reputation, only one bad one to lose it. You can spend decades working on a good name and lose it in seconds. We'll spend our lives one poor decision away from a ruined name. In that context... All right, the context of a good name being better than good ointment, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Here's how. The moment you take your first breath in this world begins a lifelong battle to pursue and preserve a good name. And it's worth it, folks. It's better than precious ointment. But you will fight and you will labor and you'll work hard knowing it takes but a second to destroy it. But the second after you breathe your last breath, that good name that you struggled and strained to preserve is secure. So in that case, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Now, quick caveat, because maybe you're thinking, well, but I know people who've died with a good name, and then years later, secrets pop up. Well, just remember, this is Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry is not a line down the middle, this is the way it always is, a promise, a guaranteed promise. It's a principle that generally speaking, this is how things work. So generally speaking, you can die with a good name and you'll know that is preserved. Your struggle anyway is over. If you want to know what is good for you while you live the few days of a futile life beneath the sun, here's Scripture's counsel. It's good to pursue a good name. And folks, there's coming a day when you won't be able to add anything more to your name. There's coming a day when life is done. And we'll see more of that in a moment. So let me just pause real quick and I want to comment. This truly is an under-the-sun reality. The need for us to struggle and strain to go after and pursue a good name in this life and preserve it, that struggle is uniquely bound to the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world. But I want to I highlight something very quickly, and just, just for a second, I want to highlight what is heightened here and what we find in our Lord who dwells above the sun. Two verses in particular. All right, remember, remember what Solomon tells us in this verse, a good name is better. All right, listen to these words in Psalm 52, 9. I will praise you forever for what you have done. 
in the presence of your faithful people, I will put my hope in your name, for it is good. You want a good name to pursue after? You want a good name to hope in? Don't hope in your own. You could lose that in a second. Pursue it, yes, but hope in the name of the Lord. It's good. Or this, remember how hard it is to struggle for us to preserve a reputation, how easy it is to lose it? Listen to this, Psalm 135, 13. Lord, your name endures forever. Your reputation, Lord, through all generations. I love that. He is not like man. We will wrestle and strain under the sun to grow and guard a good name, but rejoice in this. We serve a God whose name is only always good, and it is so forever. He'll never do a single act that stains his good name. There will never be a second of eternity that we need fear will spoil his good reputation. Oh, he held it for so many years, for eternity, and yet at one second, there it goes! All you have to do is go and read Matthew 4 or Luke 4 and watch the Son of God interact with the devil himself and know there's nothing that will besmirch the good name of our God. So praise and rejoice in that. But that brings us to the rest of our text. All right, verses 2 through 6. We've got this opening verse that sets us up. Pursue a good name. This is a good thing. All right? But... What do these verses do? These verses present three more better Proverbs. You can see that in verses 2, 3, and 5, that word better shows up, all right? We're going to look at those comparisons, but after each comparison is an explanation, because each of these comparisons is going to be the kind of comparison that he goes, here's what's good, and when he goes, here's what's better, we should stand and go, wait a minute, and so he gives an explanation. And you can see that in verse 2, for this is the end of all mankind. Verse 3, for by sadness of face. Verse 6, for is the crackling of thorns. So I would propose this. These five verses offer what we could say are three ways a good name will be pursued. A good name formed. Verse 1 gave us the premise, it's good to pursue a good name. And now we see ways that a good name is pursued. Let's look at the first one. I'll word it this way. A good name is pursued by where you go. A good name is pursued by where you go. Verse, one, verse two, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. You have that action, that movement somewhere. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. So once again, Solomon defines good by comparison. He puts on the table something commonly perceived as good, this, this house of feasting. And the idea here might be like celebration, a party, an enjoyable gathering around a meal. I don't think it's good for us to think, oh, that's, the, you know, that's a bad, you know, bad scene. That doesn't seem the idea. This is the same setting that's spoken of in Job chapter 1 when we're told that Job's sons would gather every year. They'd gather together for a meal. And they'd invite the, the sisters to come as well. And Job would offer sacrifices afterwards just in case his children sinned, but there doesn't seem like there's any kind of evil intent there in that gathering. It's just a family get-together. So maybe we could think of it this way by comparison. We could put on the table a birthday party or a family gathering like Thanksgiving dinner. These are good events. These are things that we'd look at and go, that's a good thing. Of course you'd want to go to that. But then Solomon puts something else on the table he says is better Here's something very good by comparison, the house of mourning. I told you, the things he puts on the table as better, we go, wait, what? If you want an example of this, Jeremiah 16, God gives both of these phrases. He uses both of them, house of mourning and house of feasting. And he talks to Israel and he tells them, he describes his coming judgment and he tells them in verse 5, don't enter this place the house of mourning. And he goes on to describe it, it's a place where one goes to lament or grieve the dead. Now in that context, he's talking about the judgment he's going to bring and he's telling Israel, don't, don't go to the house of mourning. This is exactly what is coming on you because of your sin. In our passage, Solomon is saying, it's better to go to the house of mourning. Right? And that's not a contradiction. 
just different contexts. In this one, this is what Solomon is saying. By comparison today, we would probably think of a funeral home or a graveside service, maybe even the deathbed of an individual. I want to ask you, is that your definition of good? Maybe we can make it more pointed. Let's say you have a schedule conflict. You RSVP'd to attend the 50th birthday party of a dear friend. And that date's coming up, and then all of a sudden you hear, you get word that there's a funeral going on, just kind of, just transpired, but the funeral's set for the same day, same time for another dear friend. And you're going, oh, which one do I go to? If you ask Solomon's advice, he would tell you this, the funeral's the better place to go. I'm not saying that's what you have to choose. I'm just saying that that sounds like what would be Solomon's advice. It's that kind of pointed instruction here. Well, why? We don't have to make up the answer. Scripture gives it to us. The house of mourning reminds us, he says, of the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. There's a lesson about life to be learned at a funeral that you will never learn at a party. What is that lesson? Two words. Life ends. A coffin preaches that lesson better than a cake. And a life that diligently listens to that message and takes it to heart lives differently. Just this week, I was reading a letter by John Newton. He's writing to a friend, pastor friend. He's talking about a funeral that he missed. He wasn't able to get there. This is the 1700s. And he comments that he really was hoping to hear the message that was preached. And there was a footnote giving the, the sermon, the title of that message that was preached for Pastor Caleb Evans. I don't know the man. Don't, don't have any information about him. He was a pastor in England. He died. And there was a man who preached his, his service. And this was, this was the title in general of his message. On the mortality of God's ministers compared to the eternality of God's Son. Folks, I don't hear that message being preached at a birthday party. The point is, Solomon's point is, at a a house of mourning, you hear about the end of life and you're brought face to face with the fact that every individual has an appointment with death. We don't learn that character-forming lesson simply anywhere. We form a good name by the places we go. Folks, again, I've left plenty of parties without a single better thought about my life. But I can honestly say, and I've been to a few funerals, I've never, I've never left a funeral without at least one thought of something that I'm more convicted about in my life. I, I haven't. I never have. And that's unsaved funerals as well brought face to face with the, with, the, with, the, with the vapor that is life. Brought face to face with the end that I will face too someday unless Christ returns first. A good name is pursued by where you go. I'm reminded of the boy Jesus. This is not a funeral parlor or a graveside, but I'm reminded of Jesus Something of this same thing in Luke 2, where the end of that chapter we read of the good name that begins to develop in this young man. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with people. I think any of us would agree that's a good reputation. That's a good name. Just prior to that, you have the story of Jesus getting lost in Jerusalem or getting left in Jerusalem. And when his parents go back, where do they find him? He's in the temple talking with the religious leaders, interacting with them, asking questions. And I'm struck with the fact that, yes, it wasn't necessarily a graveside or a funeral home, but here's a young boy of 12, and the place he goes is the place of teaching and truth, and directly after that, we're told, his reputation is growing and building. His name is becoming good, better, and better. The American missionary pioneer Adoniram Judson was an aspiring atheist at one point. As a young man out of college, he'd come under the influence of a friend, Jacob Eames. Jacob Eames was an atheist, very winsome with his words, very convincing, and Judson fell under his words. Thought, this is great. And so he was off doing his own thing. Judson went off and lived his own life for a time, and on his way back home one time, he stayed in an inn overnight. 
And that night, as he lay in bed, across the way, in another room, he heard someone groaning and crying out all night long until finally, early in the morning, the cries stopped. And Judson thought, I wonder what happened. And so when he got up that morning, he went down to the innkeeper, and they were talking, and he said, brought something about the, the noises the night before, and the man said, yes, well, that, man, that gentleman died in his, in his bed last night. And Judson, just curious, said, well, what was his name? Jacob Eames. His atheist friend had died in the same inn that very night. And it was that, it was that instance, that moment, listening to the dying cries of his friend that brought Judson himself face to face with his own mortality. And he thought, there's no way I can stay an atheist. And it was ultimately what began to bring him to Christ. A good name is pursued by where you go. One writer summarized it well with these words, by keeping in mind the certainty of our appearance at the judgment seat of Christ, we find motivation to make the most of our lives before death takes us away. Folks, you come face to face with that, with that accountability to Christ someday when you're, when you're there in the house of mourning. Now, secondly, verses 3 and 4, we see this. A good name is pursued not just by where you go, but also by what you consider. And Solomon builds on the event of death and end of life in verses 3 and 4. He goes to say, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Once again, Solomon sets the table for us with a comparison, something people would generally agree to be good, laughter. It's Solomon himself, folks, who in Proverbs 17.22 said, A joyful heart is good medicine. And we have modern renderings of that. Laughter is good medicine. A joyful heart. Most people love to laugh. That's why people pay money to go to theater halls and listen to a comedian for an hour. Spin jokes. People like to laugh. Typically, we like to hang around people who do laugh. We don't like to hang around people who are long-faced and morose and just kind of melancholy all the time. That's really not a lot of fun. We gravitate towards people who laugh and make us laugh. But Solomon's mind-bending comparison here, sorrow is better than laughter. How can the one who said a broken spirit dries up the bones suggest that sorrow or grief is better than laughter? Well, again, keep this in context. This is why I think these verses really do work as a package. Keep this in context. Look at his explanation beginning in verse 3 and verse 4. By sadness of face... The heart is made glad. Or maybe this translation is a little more memorable. When a face is sad, a heart may be glad. I want to comment on that. That word translated glad can also be used in the sense of improved. Or I think the King James actually renders it made better. Um... I've not been able to find concrete evidence on this, but it's possible the translators here used glad to try and bring some, some memorable rhyme to this. So like the CSB, sad, sad face, glad heart, right? Um, but I think, I think it's probably best to keep in mind the idea that what Solomon is after here is the improvement of one's inner man. A sad face ends up improving the heart. And that understanding seems strengthened by the parallelism in verse 4. A house of mourning tends, I'm going to work it this way, it tends to produce a wise heart. And those who are wise tend to understand the value of such an occasion. Whereas a house of pleasure, although not a bad thing, a house of pleasure tends to produce foolish hearts that don't take life as seriously. Again, this is Hebrew poetry. We're not talking guaranteed promise here every time. You can go to a party and you could walk out and go, you know what, I'm a little more soberly focused on the Lord right now. That's possible. But generally speaking, you look at the two and you watch people come out of a funeral and you go, boy, there's some pretty sober people. They've just come face to face with some things. And you watch people leave a party and you go, oh, I wonder if they're actually thinking of anything worthwhile right now. Just generally speaking. 
So a good name we pursued by what you consider sober reflection of life tends toward a wise way of life. And maybe the most relevant application today would be the tendency to avoid hard or difficult or even sad issues by filling our lives with distractions. We're so good at this. Difficult things come and we just fill our lives up quick with other things. We don't really want to dwell or deal with sad stuff, difficult stuff. And that's not to say that it's never wrong to look for something that takes the mind away for a bit. It's not to say that we should live a melancholy misery only talking about the problems of life. But folks, when the troubles and the sorrows of life increase, let me ask a question. What do you find to be your first response? Do you plunk down in front of a screen or do you give time for serious reflection on the challenges of life and the comforting truths God provides? The person who spends time in sober reflection on life and even ponders the hard things of life, I would argue, and I think the scripture's arguing, will tend to be wiser than the person who lives their lives laughing at cat videos or chuckling at comedy. This is why Titus 2 says, grace appeared, just, just, I'm going to twist the the verse here a little bit, not in a bad way, but grace appeared, not training us to laugh, but training us to live soberly. God didn't send us a comedian to save our broken souls. He sent us Christ to save us from our sin and to deal with our sorrows. I've mentioned this before, but one of the things that I enjoy reading are the journals or memoirs of believers from the past. And what's interesting to me is that as I read these journals, typically what are the most forming things in these individuals' lives are the hard things of life. For example, Andrew Bonner, pastor in Scotland, wrote of his wife's death for many years after she passed. This was every anniversary he would write an entry or two or three for a few days around it. He'd just talk about her death. And he would, initially, it was very, very hard. He he was wrestling with God in this. But you watch it. You just watch him work his way along. And then it's years. I think it was 15, 16 years or so afterwards. It's like he finally goes... It's, it's on his, the anniversary again, and he just kind of opens his hands and goes, God, I trust you with this. I, I'm paraphrasing immensely, but it's just this immense release. But you watch him wrestle, and you watch him work through this again and again, and he's growing in faith. John Newton, again, produced a sobering reflection, writing to a friend about a temporarily paralyzing stroke that afflicted another friend and fellow pastor, Andrew Fuller. You may be familiar with that name. Um, Newton wrote, he was unsure if Fuller would live, but he offered this reflection. I hope that Fuller and you and I shall so live as to be missed a little when we are gone. That's a man who's, got, who's, who's been confronted with the difficulties of life, a stroke, possibly death. He wasn't sure at the time. And he's going, boy, I hope that we can live in such a way that when we're gone, people actually miss us a little bit. That's not a selfish thought necessarily. He's really wanting to live in a good way. Or what about this striking consideration written by the Scottish pastor Samuel Rutherford to a woman in his church whose, past, whose husband had passed. Rutherford drives for the formation of his sister in Christ's character, good name, when he says, consider how in all these trials, and truly, he says, they've been many, your Lord has been loosing you at the root from perishing things and hunting after you to grip your soul. He says, Madam, for the Son of God's sake, let him not miss his grip, but stay and abide in the love of God, as the writer Jude says. Boy, there's some really stirring counsel. Some of the greatest names have been formed out of sober consideration of life. Indeed, when it comes to the greatest name being gained, that name written down in the Lamb's book of life, folks, you don't want to miss this name. If there's any good name you gain, you want the name that's written in the Lamb's book. And it's Jesus himself who says, if you want that name, part of that is going to be this, blessed are those who mourn. Better the house of mourning, especially for a sinner one who mourns over their sin. 
and realizes I need a Savior. What a good name is gained through that. Well, third, a good name is pursued by where you go, by what you consider, and thirdly, by who you hear. This is verses 5 and 6. The generally accepted good here is the song of fools, or the laughter of fools, as verse 6 says. This song, again, this is not necessarily a bad thing. We, we equate fools with a bad thing. This would be, think of it this way, these would be silly songs, all right? Uh, empty things. Not, not bad necessarily, but just things that are just sung and there's like no weight to it, there's no purpose to it, it's just kind of pointless, and I think that's emphasized in a moment by the picture he uses here. There's a certain emptiness to them, but of themselves, they're not necessarily morally bad. But Solomon again offers something better we may not initially agree with. Listening to a rebuke from a wise person is better than those silly songs. Why is it better? Well, the explanation in verse 6 is what we'd call an emblematic parallelism. Here's what that is, okay? This is poetry that presents an image like the one here, burning nettles under kettles, all right? And there's Hebrew language there that kind of gives that little bit of a rhyming. So I like that one, came across that this week, burning nettles under kettles. It's memorable. And then it provides the reality from life that parallels that image, a fool's laughter. Say, so what's going on here? Well, think of this, throw thorns onto a fire. If you ever had a campfire and you've had kind of a, a, a bucket full of just kind of twigs and some, some small twiggy stuff, thorns perhaps, all right, you throw it in the fire and what happens? Whew, great, beautiful fire right away, right? And then just as quickly, it's like, whew, there it goes. So you can imagine, here's the picture, you're trying to get, you're trying to get your, hot, your, your water hot and ready to go to make a meal, so you put a kettle over the fire, you throw those thorns on there, and whew, there's flame, oh great, it's going, you turn around, you come back, and there, where'd the fire go? Water's still cold. Didn't it do anything good? It's pretty, but it's pointless. That's his point. Those silly songs, not necessarily bad. Pretty even. But they're pointless. What good do they do? Here's what will do you good. Here's what will do you very good. Someone coming up to you and giving you a shot right across the bow with a rebuke. Hey, brother, that's not right. Hey, sister, did you think about what you just said? And Solomon says this, Proverbs 15, 31, one who listens to life-giving rebukes. Think about that, life-giving rebukes. We don't think of rebukes like this. We think they're crushing. That's just negative speech. That's toxic speech. Get away from that. This is life-giving speech, rebukes. That kind of person will be at home among the wise. Or this, Proverbs 17.10, a rebuke cuts into a perceptive person more than a hundred lashes into a fool. A hundred lashes? How many lashes would it take to make a point for you? I think it'd be one. For me, one, right? Like first sight of blood? Okay, I'm good. I got the point, right? Not a problem. He's saying, look, you can do a hundred lashes on a fool and one rebuke to a wise person and it brings more benefit to that wise person than a hundred lashes. Just this week, I was talking with someone, not in the church here, but chatting about some things, some situations in their life, and we're talking about some of this very thing, and I was sharing with, with this individual that, you know, I'm, I'm finding it more and more the case that there, there are very few people in my life who are willing and ready to come and give me the shot across the bow, but I am more and more thankful for the people in my life who will do it. And now, look, I don't always respond the right way. Sometimes it takes me a little bit to get my spirit under control. But it is a good thing. And I think any of us who've actually seen someone come, and in a gracious but truth-filled way, in a way that would mirror what Christ does for our souls, in the way the Word of God comes and does this very work, you understand the benefit that's there. Who do you hear? Whose voices do you gather around yourself? The pretty but pointless tinkling of silly voices and songs or the rewarding voices of rebuke? 
Again, this is not saying that we should only ever speak rebuke to one another. There's no point. No, we should never have a silly conversation. That's not the point here. But there is a, there is a scale of better. It's good for us to keep that in mind. What's good for you and me while we live the few days we have on this earth? Ecclesiastes 6.12, well, the answer, one of the answers is this. It's good to pursue a good name. And we can pursue that by the places we go, by the things we consider, by the voices we listen to. But I want to close with this thought, this caution, because we can become so consumed with pursuing a good name that we end up tarnishing our good name. We can become arrogant about a good name. That's my good name. How dare you say anything about my reputation? And there will be times where, frankly, folks, we're, we're maligned. Christ spoke of this, and it's going to be false things that are said about us, and it's going to hurt. And the reputation might feel like, boy, there it goes down the tubes. And there's a time to stand up and speak the truth and speak what's right, and there's a time to also go, you know what, this is just what following Christ is all about. And there will be times where that's the case. If we cling to our reputation, our good name, like it's God, we've missed it. So I would close with this admonition. Seek to live for the glory of God's name, and you'll not lack for your own good name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've told us that it is a good thing to pursue a good name. And we realize that as Christians, we have even greater ability to do this with an eternal setting in view. We ask for your help. We ask that you guard us from becoming consumed with building a name for ourselves like Genesis 11. Lord, we don't want that. But we do want to think well about the end that is coming for each of us. We do want to think well about the sober realities of life. We want to think well about them in light of the truth you've given us in your word. We want to listen to the voices that come to us with truth and with good rebuke and good instruction. And you've even promised that your word does this for us. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to seek the glory of your name and trust that as we do that, that there will be a good name that we will pursue and achieve by your grace, not for our glory, but Lord, for your own. And we pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.